But let's let's go to the Middle East and let's include in it, even though obviously they're not relegated to the Middle East. These are highly used in uh, certainly in South Asia uh, and also in a place like Somalia. But let's include the sort of like drone global warfare component in this sort of broader umbrella, because, as you know, I mean, Middle East policy has been reduced to in addition to obviously supporting vicious monarchies, dictatorships and so on. Uh, also, this very kind of one-dimensional note of terrorism, uh, which has had major global consequences and sort of organized modern U.S. foreign policy. Uh, that's absolutely right. So, so step one is to end the drone war today. Uh, I think it has absolutely no strategic purpose and just serves to 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 inflict, inflict violence on people who are already oppressed. Uh, step two is to totally invest in alternative energy at home. And I think you're never going to have uh, a just American policy in the Middle East unless the United States actually seriously works to get off fossil fuels. Uh, and of course, it's not like a lot of this oil is necessarily flowing to the United States, but it's flowing to America's allies. And, and there's this vision that the United States essentially needs to extract oil um, from the Persian Gulf and, and the various regions. Uh, so that's what I think really keeps us there. So I think the first step to really changing America's policy towards Saudi Arabia is to, you know, for example, fill New Mexico with solar panels or something or on all the government owned land. Um, for, so, so that would be a first step, really reform uh, energy policy. And once you do that, then a lot of your um, opportunity and of your um, imagination really opens up. So you could totally reform the Saudi uh, Arabian relationship, really essentially end it, stop providing uh, the Saudi uh, military with, um, and, and also, of course, the Israeli government with, with millions right. of dollars uh, in arms. I think you would stop supporting um, uh, a Likud Israeli government that totally expands, um, that constantly abuses Gaza uh, to, to, to really a, a, a terrible, uh, a, a, an almost an unimaginable degree what the, what the Israeli government does with regards to Gaza and the Gaza blockade. So use uh, America's enormous overweening influence on Israeli uh, politics to really change uh, Israeli policy with regard to Gaza and also with, with regard to the West Bank, uh, develop some sort of uh, reparations policy at the very least uh, for for those Palestinians who were who who were who were expelled during the Nakba, uh, and all of those uh, all of those really terrible crimes that the United States uh, didn't stop, or at least in in, in some sense uh, implicitly uh, supported. And then the question is, what you do with Iran? I I think people don't quite appreciate how actually destructive sanctions are. Yeah. They're sort of used as a soft tool, but they they actually truly. Uh, destroy lives and destroy the lives of ordinary people upon whom you theoretically want to build a, a more progressive future. So, so really, you also need to uh, stop sanctions in a, in a serious way and really reformulate how the United States deals with, with countries that are essentially uh, a liberal or, or following a different way of life. And I think that involves a total, uh, complete transformation of how the United States understands uh, Islam and, and Islam's role in, in, in foreign societies and Islam's role in the world. And I think leftists are, are also going to have to really uh, consider what values they, they want to promote and what the role of the United States is in, is in promoting the liberal values that, that we hear take for granted, but that might have uh, that might not have uh, particular valences in societies that the United States has long uh, been imbricated in. So it raises a lot of really interesting questions about transnational solidarities that will essentially need to be worked out, in my opinion, in practice. Yeah, I want to uh, briefly follow up on that before we get to Asia, because I, I think it raises a really interesting point, particularly the, you know, the themes around Islam, solidarity, rights, liberalism, illiberalism, but also just a much broader sense of sort of the different uh, foundations upon which people want to build their politics and their societies. And at least for me, I think actually people like Amartya Sen are really helpful for this because, you know, who's a, a very prominent Indian economist and philosopher. I think he's at Harvard now. And his sort of argument going back to the 90s in – Specifically, he was actually answering autocrats in Singapore and Malaysia who were putting across this thing called Asian values, which in contrast to the sort of anti-Muslim bias of American and European elites, they were kind of drawn to some of these uh, Asian values debates because uh, Asian values ideas, because places like Singapore and Malaysia were certainly posted 
you know, incredible gains and accomplishments in terms of market development, but also were very, very socially repressive. Like the idea of, uh, you know, getting caned in Singapore for spitting on the street <laughs> is actually like not an urban myth. Like that actually has happened. Right. And so right. these guys said, look, we have a different way of organizing our society. We're building it on Confucian uh, values and so on and so forth. And basically to, to just make it really simple, I mean, Sen's intervention was, look, the Western idea that the only place in the world that came up with an idea of individual of a sense of, of individual rights, group well-being and power accountability uh, being just specifically from the Western Enlightenment tradition is false. And you can actually trace right. ideas of holding power accountable and expanding uh, or certainly the intellectual roots that you could build democratic models on literally exist in every single social and intellectual tradition on the planet. And what you might find, and so, and also these Asian values guys are wrong too, because they're distorting Confucianism to justify their own autocratic tendencies. And so the answer is, is you got to sort of build these global sort of, you know, these, these cross-border recognition where you're, you're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and being a total relativist. Like, oh yeah, Saudi Arabia can have gender apartheid because, you know, that's how they do Islam and we're super open-minded. Uh, it, that's wrong and we oppose it. But then conversely, maybe we also recognize that somebody wants to build a rights-oriented, flourishing society that also, you know, they might be rooted in different you know, Islamic traditions, as an example. I, I don't know if that makes sense. but No, that, that makes total sense. And I think you see a lot of these discussions uh, come up and, and a lot of these issues come up in debates o over the veil, right. which was such a hot topic about 20 years ago, because um, uh, um, from, a, from what was then the American or really the French lens at the time, it was viewed as a, an, an oppressive piece of clothing. But when you actually see how it historically operated, you know, for, for example, in Cairo at various moments, in Baltimore at various moments, it's actually a symbol of, 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 of women asserting their space in the public sphere. Right. So it's actually a, a symbol of liberation when it was uh, totally interpreted here by 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 many people, by many liberals and those on the right as a symbol of oppression. Right. So we also need to be very important not to impose our own frameworks onto these other spaces in which the United States empire is is uh, is involved. And I think it just highlights the importance of that. There is no one solution to any to any of those issues about cultural uh, differences and cultural relativism and that you really have to get in, on the ground and have a deep uh, knowledge of the area and really always the sine qua non of this is always listen to local peoples you know if you're a member of an american ngo that happens to have a lot of resources you you could, should never ever or a left-wing ngo or, or whatever it may be a good organization there's a lot of problems with ngos we get to that in a different pay, case but let's say you're a good person trying to do good things what you really need to do is listen to people on the ground and, and really build networks of solidarity across borders where you're not just imposing your own view. And it's a very difficult thing to do because we're all, all are prisoners of our own identities. Right. But it's something that I think we need to really uh, work toward um, as, as long as the United States has all this overwhelming power, right? I think we can't retreat from these questions because this is the pure material fact that so much capital is centered here. And the military, the world's military is really the United States's um, military. So we, we have to think about these questions, even if we prefer, you know, to, to leave them aside, because they're really quite difficult and oftentimes won't have a good answer. 100%. All right. Asia, um, which I, <laughs> I know that's huge, but I mean, I don't know. So what do we got? I mean, obviously, there's the North Korea dimension, there's China, the reemergence of sort of power politics. Um, you know, TPP, right. India, whatever way you want to take it. But what's the what's the progressive orientation towards Asia? So, so the, I think this is really important because I think this will be a big division between progressives like myself and realists like Stephen Walt and John Mersheimer. Right. So realists like who, who otherwise you leftists should should build coalitions with, particularly with regards to U.S. policy in Europe and the Middle East, where there's actually a lot of agreements. But where the biggest disagreement between people like me and Walt and Mersheimer is that Walt and Mersheimer think that the rise of China as a serious great power competitor necessitates the United States to maintain some sort of serious presence in East Asia and the South China Sea. Uh, so I would disagree with that because I think that assumption is based on the idea that the United States should never face any peer competitor and that unipol uh, that some sort of primacy and unipolarity is actually really necessary to maintain world peace. And I think this is a very a mid 
20th century idea, understandably emerging from World War II. But in some sense, in, in my opinion, the rise of another great power could actually good, be good for world peace and good for uh, stability. One, because it, it'll um, actually allow the United States to, to exit from the region, uh, the region and have some sort of ideally peaceful security transition to where China essentially assumes responsibility for a lot of the security concerns of the region and which will bring a lot of capital home and will also prevent the American perversion of an area of the world in which it hasn't been involved particularly long and about which it doesn't know very much. Now, the other the problem, though, is that China is certainly authoritarian and it's not only authoritarian, but it's authoritarian capitalist. So this also creates, again, difficult questions about what do you do as you know, as, as a leftist who has a particular value position on the world, uh, when you're essentially ceding uh, an enormous part of the world to an authoritarian capitalist power, and of course, I should underline the United States has done, a, 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 of course, a, an enormous amount of damage to the region. So I'm not saying that the U.S. would be better or has been better, but I'm just saying these are difficult ethical questions for for a leftist to actually pursue. Right? Do, do you want, for example, Chinese authoritarianism? to now govern the entire Eastern Hemisphere of the world. I mean, right. ideally, no, because that limits freedom and limits liberation in, in really important ways that I think leftists should be concerned with. But then again, there's also the reality of that the United States shouldn't and doesn't have the political will to maintain permanent presence in a region that's so far from its shores. So I think the first step to do is get beyond this idea that a great power competitor is always necessarily negative for the United States. But then we really have to think through what we as leftists do to help combat the authoritarian impulses of the Chinese Communist Party. And it's not an easy uh, question. Now, I, I think some of these things will be regionally worked out on their own, particularly the Sino-Indian conflict, which is kind of always at a low ebb. But I think with the rise of Modi, it, it, it's getting even more powerful. You know, another member of this authoritarian axis that Bernie had pointed out in a, in a, in a recent speech. So I think in some sense, it's up to the peoples of this part of the world to work out their own history for them without the perversions of the United States. But we in the United States could also take some sort of a, at least sort of ethical position about what is the proper way uh, to, 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 to resist authoritarianism or, or to transform it in a democratic and, and liberatory direction. Yeah, and, and without military aid, <laughs> without military aid, but in, and included in that right. already, you know, issues that I don't want to, you know, that that of course, I mean, I understand why people crit. I think there's like three steps, right? There's the sort of recognition that human rights are a proxy and have absolutely, including you know, literally like a proxy for. U.S. militarism and invasions, uh, and right. and and also, but even in a more soft variety, a proxy to formalize a Western-dominated order. Okay, that's a very value valuable and correct critique. And there's a a certain intelligence and corrective in, you know, don't get your own house in order. You know, particularly, I mean, if right. you're in the United States, focus on what you're doing in Yemen or you know, and so on. Hundred percent. But I think the third step is there is this, if you really have this left perspective, there is a real concept of global solidarity. And so therefore, like the Uyghur, the Uyghur population can't be eliminated in that. Uh, I would, the occupation of Tibet, uh, you know, one can have whatever view they want to have of, you know, Tibetan society. And I would recognize, you know, sure, there's some romanticism. I think there's also, that's another area where there, there's been an overcorrected critique of that society as well. All of that being as it may, it's uh, it's occupied and it's being you know culturally cleansed and environmentally destroyed. Uh, you know these are real issues of anybody who is concerned about these issues wherever they may take place. Yeah, and I think that's right, and particularly what's going on now with the Uyghurs. For, from my limited layman's understanding, yeah. there seems to be a lot of they're, they're being organized in concentration camps, and, yeah. and the left shouldn't shrink from criticizing that. Uh, and I don't think the left does uh, shrink yeah. from criticizing that, uh, to be frank. Uh, but the question is, then, then what do you do when you don't want the American military to do anything, essentially, and you don't want sanctions, which will destroy the lives of ordinary people? So I think you could essentially adopt, on one hand, the ethical position that living in the, in, in the imperial metropole, that you do have the more voice than, than, than many of the voiceless who are affected by these policies. Uh, and then on the other hand, I think, like you said, build true global solidarities, uh, uh, whether they be working class solidarities, whether they be cultural 
solidarities or whatever it may be, build these sorts of solidarities so that at least you can give uh, aid and assistance to those living within these societies who want to transform it uh, in ideally a peaceful way, uh, both mostly because I think any other non-peaceful way will be immediately crushed by the awesome power of the Chinese military. Let's go to Africa.